behind the bar. My life is more than money and jewelry. My story's so crazy, dog. I said make a movie behind the bar. I went from playing sports to exotic whips. Ain't gotta tell me, dog. I know I'm the shit behind the bar. My life is more than money and jewelry. My story's so crazy, dog. I said make a movie behind the bar. I went from music exec to this podcast. Now I finally feel at home and left behind the bar. Yo, 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 what's good, everyone? And welcome to another brand new episode of the world famous, the award-winning Behind the Baller podcast, always recorded in 8K high doge finished sound, museum quality professional podcasting only, and done by none other than the eight-time podcast producers of the year, the Dust Brothers, my man Miles, my man Jordan. Yo, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben Baller, not Ben Humble, also known as the Korean John Cusack, a.k.a. the Forrest Gump of Hip Hop, a.k.a. Odessu, and a.k.a., of course, the Washed Lord. I am the host of this show, and uh, it is my favorite fucking day of the week. I've told all you guys here, before that Thursday is my favorite day of the week, but this episode today will solidify. It will, it, it will make so much more sense because Granville was on Thursday nights and only on Thursday nights, okay? And today's guest is a longtime dear friend of mine who is legit one degree of separation from every single A-list celebrity in the world. I'm not talking about YouTubers. I'm not talking about fucking social media influencers. I'm talking about real motherfucking stars, okay? I'm talking about Robert Downey Jr. I'm talking about Keanu Reeves. And of course, we're talking about Johnny Depp, who, guys, I cannot make this shit up. Today is Johnny Depp's birthday, okay? We did not plan this, but, um, I, you know, I don't know. Look, man, we are going to do something that we have never done before on this show, and that is, I'm not going to do an intro. I just need to do the call out, let you guys know what the fuck it is. We will get right to a fucking commercial and drop this interview, which is, again, so fucking crucial to my K-Town Hustler series. And I know I need to do three, but this is part of K-Town Hustler part two. We get into my DJ nightlife and everything, right? And we just scratch the surface, okay? And this is just a, this is a celebration, guys. A celebration of that W, the recent victory for my dude, Mr. Depp, against Amber Turd. So Miles, yo, set me up with some of that Lakey Lake, something real jazzy, real smooth, and we'll be right back with my bro, Josh Richmond. Guys, this Monday for the NBA Finals Game 5, your captains are calling you. Captain Picks is having a wager, watch, win, party this Monday at Dave & Buster's in Hollywood, and I will be in the building. Tip-off is at 6 p.m., so get there early. Check out the link in the bio for an exclusive offer, $50 power card, two premium drink tickets, one week of VIP access and raffle tickets for a t-shirt and signed baseball card, all for just $100. Did you hear what I said? Plus, if you are an existing Captain Picks community member, not only will you be a VIP, but you will get two free drink tickets. DM at the Captain Picks on Instagram to RSVP and check the link in the episode description. We're taking over the game at Dave and Buster's Hollywood. Come break your bookies bankroll with me and the Dust Brothers in person or in our community of winners at CaptainPicks.com. This weekend, Glover Texaria defends his title against the number two ranked contender, Jerry Proshaka at UFC 275, and my bookie has all the action. It's not too late to place your bets. Only one of these fighters will walk away the heavyweight champion, but anyone can walk away a winner with my bookie. Sign up at mybookie.com, use my promo code Ben. Baller, and you'll instantly get a deposit bonus up to a thousand dollars. And don't forget, UFC 275 is a double header. You can use the extra dough to bet on the women's flyweight title, Valentina Shevchenko versus Talia 
Santos and take advantage of an even bigger payout. Remember to use my code BenBaller and bet with me only at my bookie. The only way watching these fights could get any better is to get paid by doing it, and my bookie makes it a possibility. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with my bookie. Yo, 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 you already know the deal. BTB Army, Ben Baller Podcast. That would be behind the baller. You know, our biggest shows that we've ever had weren't the A-list celebrities. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't the social media people who have 17 million followers. It wasn't, you know, someone who's an OG like George Lopez. It wasn't somebody young like Jordan Woods. It's always been the, you know, the random surprise guest that didn't have a major social media following. And this next guest I have, I've already mentioned to you guys about three or four times in the Katon Hustler series. I think he was in episode two because he was a big part of my life at that time. We reconnected recently and picked up like Kobe and Shaq, Magic and Kareem, you know, and it was just a, it's a big part of my life. He's always been a big homie. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome my boy, Josh Richmond to the microphone. What's up, Josh? I am... Absolutely floored that this is happening right now. This is fantastic. Hey, man, you know, it's funny. Um, A lot of people, like, when I ask people, what do you wish, you know, like, would you want a chain? Would you want this? Like, we want to be, you know, you want to hang out. You want to go to a Dodger game. You want to sit on the Lakers floor seats. What do you want to do? People really say, like, I'd love to just see the man cave. And you're, like, less than a dozen people who have been in here. Oh, really? Yeah, because I just, you know, it's, my kids sleep here and stuff. So it's, like, not here technically. You know what I mean? But, like... You know, I've known you so long, bro. I've spent how much time at your house and over the years. I know it's like, so not many people could just come here. It's interesting because everybody who follows you, which is obviously global, have seen this. So you walk in, like I walked in here and felt like I had been here just because, <laughs> you know, it's so hyped up and it's just part of your tapestry, so to speak. But uh, it's really, it's really pretty great. And it's also in the neighborhood that a lot of the kids I grew up with is in. And it's like a really dope, low key neighborhood. And people don't realize like how nice this is. You're like in a really great spot in LA. Yeah. And I'm glad we're recording here instead of my San Francisco crib, you know, that makes sense and stuff. No, I, I mean, it was a 10 minute drive. Like I drove through my normal drive through the hills to get here. Our baseball car shops around the corner. Yeah. School I went to grammar school is around walking distance, like pretty great. So started off how long have we known each other right explain to my listeners like when we met what did i do for you work wise like just break that down as fast as you can well so ben he had his guy and his guy was nick adler nick adler's father is one of the most famous people in the entertainment industry he's the guy in the white beard sits next to jack nicholson on the floor at laker games like lou adler is the g of g of g's and his Son, Nick, was Ben's best friend. And these kids were like, to us, because you know I'm older than them, these kids were like the little next generation. I used to see Nick in the offices up at the Roxy, and his boy right next to him everywhere when you would see Ben. And then and then Nick and Ben, and I think David, right, from uh, the TV show on Fox. Uh, Married with Children. Married with Children. You guys did a club, right? Ballistics? Yeah. yeah. So they did like a hip-hop club when like long before hip-hop had crossed over. Like they did it when it was super OG. Oh, man. And they were kids. And so... You know, Ben was just like me, a staple in the streets of Hollywood. So ultimately, I was older, and I always kind of came with the older brother vibe, and he always came with the, you know, Ben, by the way, just so you guys know, he was exactly like this. He was always like this. <laughs> yeah. He never wasn't like this, whether he had stuff, didn't have stuff, his exact approach, his cadence, his his intrepid delivery. Ben has been exactly the same since he was a teenager. So, and, and then as time- and I, and I never told anybody this. I never told anybody that me and you talk like this, and I tell people I was who I was before social media ever existed. Oh yeah, no, the social media was just you're like a you're what's great about social media. There's a lot of what's not great, but you are what's great. You do your own stuff. Without it, you would still be you. But it's like an accelerant to all this stuff that you did because you know you were always a hard worker. Ben later, you know, something that really took our relationship to a very close level was Ben was the DJ at one of the greatest clubs probably that's ever happened in the history of nightlife. And I and I say that with a straight face because nobody could step to us and say anything different. Ever. And it was called Granville and Ben was a DJ, you know. He was he wasn't Ben Baller yet. <laughs> well I was yeah, Ben Yang Baller and then yeah, pretty much. Because I was Ben Baller, but that name wasn't like established. It wasn't established and it wasn't a full moniker. I was who I was, but it was like 
you know, people knew me as Ben Yang. And I always tell people when we talk about that stuff, especially as your name grew and your whole thing grew, and whether we took a break for a while. <laughs> but uh, you know, I would tell people, I said, listen, what you don't know is Ben was a Ben was a an A and R guy at Priority Records. Like Ben was signing acts while he was DJing the club. Like all of his stuff, he and I this is speaking to you guys, his listeners and his fans. You, he and I are very similar. People, you can't, you could say he's a jeweler, like you could say I'm a nightlife person, but you really wouldn't be catching the real vibe if you just try to sum us up in something. We are true LA denizens who are ambassadors of what's amazing about this place, which is the most amazing city in the world. And the funny thing about that is I would be on tour with Dr. Dre somewhere or doing something in New York. I would fly back to make sure that I didn't miss Thursday night. You know what I'm saying? Unless that one exception where we did Flamingo Club in New York with, uh, I forgot who we did it with. No, it was, you you might have did it. I didn't do it. Well, it was Rick. We did a Glamville in New York yeah, and it yeah. wasn't whatever, boom. But name one highly memorable moment amongst us, whether it be at the club, anything, just anything you can make think of. Oh, there's freestyle. Dude, for us, there's so many. First of all, we would do the club and then like the next day we'd be down, you know, trying to find the, the most unique shoes, sneakers that you could never find down like the Sloss and Swap meeting. And Ben's like selling his priority records promo stuff out the back of his trunk and like <laughs> super hustle. But but also, you know, it's the dialogue, you know, it's the girls, it's the life. And you know, when you're when you're the purveyors of the life, everybody's kind of at your fingertips. So we we were young and kind of wild and had everything at our fingertips and then like you know we're in the forum club all the time and we're back at pick fair where rick lived with jerry bust you know it was funny to watch that lakers show on hbo like we lived that life Dude, pick we, fair. we were actually there so it's hard to say one thing because it was the canvas of our life like we that was just our life people think it's crazy but when it's your life it doesn't seem crazy it seems normal well one thing i want to bring up is in a matter of a year I'm pretty good at uh, categorizing things, right? And just kind of like putting things in one year. In that one year, I had snuck Kobe into the club. We had Suge and Tupac in there. Chris Robert, Fo- Robert Downey took the mic one night. And Robert Downer also was not Iron Man. Oh, no. He was 107 pounds carrying fucking a, a barbell <laughs> with some weird walkie-talkie thing in his back pocket. <laughs> Woody was videotaping. This is, dude, you have to understand, my boy was, you know, I've said this before, like, he, you know, he's tight with Depp. We'll get into that in a little bit. Tight with Downey. Tight with Keanu Reeves, who pulls into the first experience of Korean barbecue. I've take Josh to Wuleok in Koreatown, like, and this was, like, the best, like, fanciest Koreatown, K-Town uh, barbecue restaurant. He walks in there with, like, some combat boots on. And a mohawk from that movie he did with River and Kevin Klein. But not even a good mohawk. Like, oh, no. a fucking, like, he did it himself. And then paid for the entire meal, which was crazy, and right? And the Koreans were talking shit about him in Korean. Yeah, they're talking shit about him. About talking all shit about of us. Russell Simmons, everybody. Rick Rubin. <laughs> yeah, oh, my God, Rick Rubin. I forgot. That was another reason uh, me and him became close for a little bit, because of you. Are we allowed to cuss? We can just get whatever the fuck you want. Say fucking cunt, bitch, good, pussy, hey, whatever good, the fuck good. you want. I just want to make sure, man, they so, know those little kids. But also, in that, Chris Farley had passed away about a week after he came to Granville. So just, it was such an amazing thing. We were on CNN. We were on every entertainment. I mean, it was like, this this club, for your fans that don't know, it was a club, a hip-hop club. Ben's a DJ. It was, I used to call it No Diggity, right? It was like No Diggity at midnight. And then I would get up on a microphone up on stage and the club would stop. Like, you know, if you stop the music at a hip-hop club, it was a riot. Yeah. Our club, we stopped it. The entire club sat down cashed out money and then the hottest strippers you've ever seen in the world came out and and danced on the stage and you have people like naomi campbell fucking ted fields <laughs> yeah you know, billionaires throwing cash out ron burkle just it was just crazy you know and it was before hip-hop had even crossed over still it was still taboo it was still like a you know a different thing um and we say that but in your own words i'm just curious because this is a business podcast so we do have to talk about some money right how do you earn a living me yes well, I mean, I, I, I had done about 300 voiceovers by the time I was 15 years old. I had won 30 or 40 Clio and IBA awards, you know. Um, 
I was a child star on the radio essentially. And then, you know, I wanted to be a normal person. I didn't want to, I never thought of it as a career. I just, that's just something I did. So then it was like acting crazy, running these wild streets in LA. And then just like, cause my dad was like, you know, what are you doing with your life? <laughs> so, so I started going on auditions and I worked as an actor for a lot of years, but I was like, all my friends are blowing up. You know, Keanu got the role I was reading for in River's Edge. And then Christian Slater was asking for too much money on Heather's. And I thought maybe I would get his role. And then he got it. And I had to take a little part. I was tired of always taking the, the offbeat buddy role. You know, I did that skateboarding movie with Josh Brolin and, and uh, Thrashing, which is like the only skateboarding movie until they made Lords of Dogtown. But right. like, well, Gleam in the Cube was kind of. But it wasn't a skateboarding no, movie. No, yeah, you're, right, it was you're like, right. So and, and to this day, like going all over, wherever I go in the world, somebody talks to me about Thrashing, which is really, I'm super proud of it. it even I'm sorry, sidebar. Where, where's Josh Brolin from? Here. Dude, my street, my old street, St. Ives, his dad, James Brolin, had a house at the end of it, and he lived there. When we were making thrashing, he was living on my old street. We never knew him. No one knew him. But I guess he also then grew up like up north, maybe in Ojai or somewhere. But he is from okay. here, and his okay. dad is from here. Because I always fuck with him. And, 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 you know, I thought he was a great actor until he fucked up a Korean, one of the greatest movies in the history of creation. Oh, boy. Fucking destroyed. I never saw The American. I would never watch it, but I'm just saying, one of my monikers on the show, when I do my, my call out, is I'm Odesu, which is the star, oh boy. But Josh did become one of the great living actors. No, Josh is insane, really, really incredible. good. And a great guy, funny and soulful no, no. and amazing guy. Seems cool. So you did all that, and then obviously- well, so, so what happened was, is I was like, all, all my friends are blowing up. I'm, you know, super tight with Downey. We're young and wild and, you know- I just realized, like, I'm going to have to get through all my boys to get there, or I'm going to have to do, like, a one-man show, like a Whoopi Goldberg and Eric Bogosian. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to have to do something because, you know, with my long hair and I didn't wear shoes and I was so wild, like, they just weren't having me. And I was like, you know, my ego my ego was so big that I couldn't stand being such a crumb bum, right. you know, like getting little scraps here and there. And so... I, I didn't know what was going to happen, really. I mean, I knew I could always do it. To this day, I know I can. I still do stuff. You know, I still, I will still act in things. And I know if I ever had to feed my family, I would go out there and it'd be fine. But like, it was just, a, I don't like going and begging for work and auditioning is a really hard thing on your mind. Bro, trust me, I, I get it. So, so what happened is I, I was also on the whole rock scene, as you know, you know, all that whole scene that happened with Guns N' Roses and Faster Pussycat, Jane's Addiction, all the bands in LA. I was very close to that. My sister was six years older and she had always been on the cutting edge of any music scene in LA. And there was just a lot of familiarity and stuff. And it was, it was another complete, you know, window of my life. And so... I became close with Guns N' Roses and I, I was close with Axel at the point when they're now the biggest band in the world and he wanted to make Michael Jackson and Madonna videos. Like that's what he was saying. They hadn't made those yet. And so here we go. He enlists me. I'm like, uh, <laughs> I was nervous, right? Cause I mean, I knew people were gonna be mad. So we ended up writing this huge concept. It was the Don't Cry video. Prior to that, we had made that video with the Terminator. And I was right. like, he throws me to the wolves and I'm fighting with the producer of the Terminator and like, you know, <laughs> always thrown to the wolves. But I, I held my own and we made these great videos and that was money, but like, I didn't then go on and make videos. I didn't say, oh, I'm the guy that makes big videos now. I was like, what? And I fell in. Uh, you know, our old dear friend Rick, who's passed, had started to do On the Rocks which was the private club at, above the Roxy that Lou Adler owned that was only people had keys, Magic Johnson, Jack Nicholson, right? It was now open. And, this and, was the club, by the way, guys, that Heidi Fleiss, yes. the biggest Hollywood madam, like scandal had happened and, and a lot of the activity happened there. Rick did a night and Heidi and Victoria did a night. Yeah. And so Rick Rick was kind of getting into the nightlife game. He's like, do this, do this party with me. And I was like, dude, I'm I can't do nightclubs. And so he begged for my help. He thought I wouldn't be great at it. I was like, ugh. Anyway, I helped and I realized that very quickly my help was extraordinarily valuable. And I fell into this nightlife thing where this party we did was just worldwide. Like it was the wildest. Ben was the DJ. I did a, like a free form Lenny Bruce George Carlin, heavy metal craziness on the mic. Then like the hottest girls you've ever seen come out and take their clothes off. Then the girls in the crowd from LA come and take their clothes off. And this is like very hip hop mid mid nineties. But, but hold on, wait a second. Let me interrupt this. I would be the guy playing the two minute songs for these girls to take their clothes off. And there'd be three songs per girl. Josh curated all the music. I didn't like any of the music. I didn't know shit about Hog and all this stuff and everything. And the crazy thing is, what was the song? The um, the beautiful people. The, was that Marilyn Manson? Yeah. Okay, all this stuff. But this motherfucker one day decides to surprise me, gives me a CD or and, and it was blank. 
And it was the first time anyone's ever heard the Foo Fighters Puff Daddy fucking Benjamins remix. And I'm the guy who has every B-side, white label, vinyl, everything. And these motherfuckers. How did you guys get that, by the way? I got it because Evan Strauss was Jimmy's assistant. Evan used to feed me everything out of that office. Was Foo Fighters signed to them? What yeah, was it? yeah. Do you know great Dave Grohl or did you know? I've met him. He's a nice oh, okay. guy. But no, that all okay. came from Evan Strauss. I was like, how the fuck did... I was like... The this, it was like weird because you guys don't understand like hearing Aerosmith and Run the MC all right cool this was just really just unheard of shit yeah nobody was giving Ben something he didn't have Ben prided Not himself was, you went yeah. to the record stuff you did all that stuff you went and got everything so yeah. and it's funny you just told that story Ben I did not remember that and I just now remember that no you guys surprised me one day I didn't know what the fuck was on well, there there was no you guys that was me yeah Rick was in the back doing something you know wrong. who tried to take credit for that Anthony Bellinger <laughs> Anyway, I, I swore that we weren't going to mention any nefarious Sorry. scumbags of Fuck LA. Em. You skipped one part, though. I remember you from two things before I met you. There was a folklore of you, right, of your existence. And I remember the no shoes and all that, right? But I didn't know you then. And then if you knew me because of Nick, finally, you know, you were showing love, right? And I remember you were actually smoking way back then and everything. You didn't mention, because Fright Night, that had me fucking dying when the, were you playing fucking uh, um, paper, rock, paper, scissors by yourself? Like you were doing some crazy yeah. shit. <laughs> yes. And then, you by the way, that. did you guys hear this? He was playing rock, paper, scissors by himself and he was losing. Like dude's fucking crazy. I was playing a lunatic in the mental, in the, in the lunatic. Right, right. With and then you McDowell. fucking hit the dude in the head. And then, um, by the way, Zach Galligan, right? Was he? He what? used to come to, to Granville all the time. Well, yeah, he lived with Rick. Oh, okay. Um, we would, um, we, everyone would call him Goonies even though it was Gremlins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but... One big thing was you were on 21 Jump Street. Oh, yeah. And that was a big show. It, it was. It was my favorite. It was, it was watershed work for me because I was always taking these penny ante parts, the ones I could get with my long hair or whatever. Yeah. I got this part that was like tailor-made for me. And I, 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 he was just a crack-dealing, gun-toting, you know. I mean, bro, he played an essay. Like, even these essay pages they play. Like, yo, you know, when Johnny won, like, it was cr these fucking crazy pages. I start finding real old, like, obscure, you know, dep rolls. And I remember, like... Um, we'll get in that in a second. I wore, I wore my boy's troop jacket. I brought my corduroy Fila hat. I brought all my stuff. You know, I, so you'll laugh at this. They didn't have, you know, once again, I didn't wear shoes then, but I knew the shoes I wanted to wear. So I was like, listen, you got to get me big, um, you know, high tops. They're in Canada. They, we filmed it in Canada. They came with these like thin little Converse, these oh, sorry ass. Man. And so the one thing that's not right is the shoes in it. Because the funniest thing is I didn't have any shoes then. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. Wearing socks, I guess, so, has its disadvantages. This is the only part because I'm up in that DJ booth and I don't get to really go around. Like, I, that was one thing I hated. I didn't get to come out of the booth, hang out. One time for Lisa Boyle, I threw like 400 bucks. 400 bucks in 1996 was like... Five thousand dollars now. I mean, I'm being. Am I lying? No. And also, like, you know, you 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 were doing good, but you weren't rolling like you are now. Yeah. So, um, I know Downey's been there. I remember. Never saw Key under there. Did Depp ever pull up to Granville ever? I don't think so. Okay, because I met him at your birthday party. I don't remember what year it was. At Sunset Marquee. I forgot which one it was at because I, so. I remember when he pulled up and Guy O'Siri took Rick Rubin to go see System of a Down for the first time, leaving my party. Yeah, and at the same time, how about Sister Willie Down got signed while me and you were there at a Snot show when I was the punk rock band Snot's DJ, and we got them I fucking signed. I you were Snot's DJ. Well, Snot's DJ, we got them fucking signed, and Nick Ather was like, yo, dude, that's a claim to fame. We got them signed at the Roxy, you know what I'm saying? Bino, boom, whatever. Sister Willie Down is obviously an enormous band now. Going back, I remember you guys were talking, and there was all this talk because Leonardo DiCaprio was the biggest actor in the world, boom, and you're like, fucking Depp had that fucking role, bro. He turned it down. And I thought that was funny because I was wondering what you guys were talking about, but he was also amazed that I, I remember, never forget this because we're, you know, both, Josh is deep in the hobby. For, I, have all, I have so many people from the hobby that listen to this show. This dude never stopped. Like this motherfucker was collecting starting lineups. He was always in it. So I went to Beverly Hills Baseball Card Shop on Robertson Boulevard and that dude, bought- That dude was, I, that guy Fuck was, that guy. He but, was rough. But I bought- uh, Oscar De La Hoya signed glove. I remember it, that. And Depp was like, holy shit. Like, damn, you know, because De, De La Hoya was the biggest boxer at the time. I remember that. And then I like, have that. Yeah. So we're just, you know, random talks that, you know, um, obviously, wow, the fuck would I ever know Johnny Depp except for you? Everyone knew that house was his behind the, in front of the standard, you know, whatever. And, you know, all this shit. He owns the whole street now. So tell me about your relationships with like these megastars. Like, 
Johnny, Robert, Keanu, like real quick, I've met them through you, all of them, but my sister obviously is, you know, Keanu's manager now and also a stylist for 20 fucking years. But like, how'd you meet these guys? Well, I think when you come from where I come from, you know, I grew up in the hills above the Sunset Strip. I grew up in Laurelwood, which is like on the top of the hill. And then when I was a teenager, I lived with my dad's on up Sunset Plaza. And, you know, when you live there and you're from there, everything that happens here bisects you, where you live. It's, I, I always have this joke that, like, I rent the boats to the tourists, right? If you were from Belize and your family owned a little slip, you would rent boats to the tourists. Well, I essentially have been renting the boats to the tourists for 20-some-odd years. And when you ask about the relationships, it's kind of like who you played Little League with or who you played basketball with or who you, you know, had a band with. Well, we were all young, coming-up people in town. I met Keanu because he got the role in a movie that I really, really wanted. And we became best friends from day one. And he's like, he, he's that type of dude. And Johnny, I had known Johnny because I was having a carnal knowledge with a young woman who was in this movie that no one talks about of Johnny's called Private Resort. Rob Morrow is also in it. Hector Elizondo. It's actually kind of funny. I was with the girl who was the lead. I'm at her apartment in like Mar Vista in some shithole. And, <laughs> and there's these pictures on the ground. And I'm like, who's that? She's like, that's Johnny Depp. I'm like, Johnny, what? And he like was beautiful. You know, oh, he, he was just like, was I handsome, was like, man. and I hated on beautiful people because I was, yeah. you know, so <laughs> Jewish. And so uh, uh, later, you know, because I was also in the music scene, he moved out here with a band. He was a rocker. He lived right. in the Fontenoy in Hollywood with Nick Cage. He was a rocker. He was out here with right. a band. So I, and like sometimes I would see him in Hollywood. Who's that guy? And then I got Thrash in that skateboarding movie. And one of the girls in it was Cheryl and Fenn, whose brother Leo did the club at where we did Granville. It was all kind of connects. And, and remember, she walked up and got the job. And we were all kind of standing in the street at the casting office. And who's that? Oh, that's Leo Fenn's sister. Oh, really? Who's she? Oh, she's with Johnny Depp. And I was like, ding, ding. Okay, this guy clocking this guy again. And then, you know, we like halfway would like cool guy look at each other in circles whatever net we weren't friends we just i know that dude i know that dude whatever and then i heard he got the show and then i saw him one day outside of a club with one of his buddies and was i wasn't in the nightclub business yet but like i knew everyone so i was like i walked up to him i was like hey bro congratulations he was like Ugh. you know he he was grateful for the money and the opportunity because you know this was a guy that had come from dirt and so he was grateful but like he knew it was a little corny. He was never like thinking it was the coolest thing in the world. You know, he was grateful, but like I got the vibe and he was like, Oh, thanks man. Yeah. Just, you know, up in Vancouver, it's like, you know, outpost up there, got him in the club. And then, and then literally not months later, I auditioned and got the show for that role we were talking about. So I went up to Vancouver and I'm like, well, this dude is either going to be real cool or he's going to be a dick. And sure enough, when he saw me, he was it was like we were old friends because he was just stuck up there in Canada and miserable. So big hugs, big love. And the, the, I think what cemented it, too, besides the fact that we just hung so hard, was that I had a demo tape from the hottest band on the planet. And we got in the van and drove away from the set. And I said, I got to play you something. This is the hottest shit is going to be the biggest shit there is. And I dropped in the Guns N' Roses demo tape. Oh, wow. And he, and he was blown away. Holy and, shit. And dude. so, and I still have that tape, by the way. Of course I do. So, you know, I did the show. They realized that, oh, shit. Well, we're happy that Johnny's happy, but these two are gone. We're not going to be able to control <laughs> these two. And then two, a week later, I did the show, flew home. They wrote me a sequel episode. I was up there a week later. Like, to do another show that nice. was, and that was dope. And then, he, and then two years later, I did like one of the great episodes of all time where I was like a juvie on death row. And by that time we were just locked, you know, we're like Gemini brothers and he, it's always been like that. I think honestly, and I know this is like taking a, a different turn. My mom died when I was young and my dad died when I was pretty young too. And when I first went up and did the show, my dad had just died maybe two months before. And, uh, I had just gone through a little fake heartbreak and like he was miserable breaking up with Cheryl Lynn and we just bonded. And I think, I think these type of relationships, you know, with Bob Downey, I mean, I always say that Bob was in our circle, you know, him and Anthony Michael Hall were fucking with Rick and like th he, Bob was in my circle. No, and, for sure. and, and from the day that we met, we were just like two kindred spirits. And so, and by the way, if you grow up where I grew up and if you live where I live, everyone's going to end up coming around. So there's so many more people we could talk about that we're mutually friends with or whatever. I'm just like, I always joke that I'm like the Paul Revere statue outside of Boston. Like I'm just, you know, I'm a Bro, fixture. I tell people, I'm a fixture here. I have three major monikers, right? And one of them is on the Forrest Gump of hip hop because I've been around everyone. <laughs> yeah. am, am I lying? Like, remember when I met Biggie, when I met, you know, I told you these stories. 
the thing that's related to this question I just asked you about, Johnny, about Robert and about fucking Keanu is the amazing fact that you guys are still at the up and up on the level. I get a fucking call from my, si I'm sorry, I get a text from my sister and she goes, I'm on a private jet going to San Francisco with Keanu. Guess who's on the plane with me? And I'm like, how big is a PJ? She goes, it doesn't matter. It's a PJ. It's not very big at all. It, no, goes, it was actually a huge jet. Oh, and she's like, I'm with Josh. And I'm like, what? She goes, we're going to San Francisco. I'm like, what the fuck? And she's like, well, you know, you knew Josh is great. I was like, no, I know, but this is just crazy because it's my sister. It's my blood sister, right? And then, you know. It was the Matrix premiere in December. He flew he flew his tight-knit group up. It of was course. A great time. And for a little bit, I started this brand with ASAP Rocky. It was dope. It was cool. It was like this little thing. And, you know, I forget my sister's fucking, Bob's fucking stylist too, right? So she's dressing Robert Downey Jr. for all kinds of stuff, Iron Man shit yeah, here and I've there. I've seen your sister more in the last 10 years than I've seen you. <laughs> <laughs> right? So... He's in Paris doing some promo for things, and she puts my fucking overcoat, like a pea coat, on him, and does this video. And I fuck Jane, thank you so much. Boom, and then his best friend or his assistant dies, and my sister is in pieces. Oh my you god, Jimmy me, Rich, Jimmy Rich, I'll cry right now. You, you text me within two minutes of my sister, and I was like, what the fuck? And you said, go to the page, check it out. Boom. So it's just crazy how that all ties along, right? And enough now, you know, we've talked enough shit. You know, um, fuck all the bullshit. We've warmed you guys up. Let's get to some Wagyu, right? Let's get to some motherfucker. Let's get to the fucking A5, right? We never even touched on our sports shit either. Dude. Oh, I mean, that's, that's a whole nother. That's, that's part two, great, you know, whatever. Great. But bro, how do you feel about this verdict that just happened last week <laughs> with the Amber Heard defamation trial? Oh my gosh, Ben. Um, I've just got back from London. Um, <laughs> you know, he's my family, Johnny, and if anyone who's ever met him knows like it's the stuff that was being said is not even possible like he's just not it's like if you know him at all you know it's not possible people don't just start becoming like that in their 50s there's no record of it there's no woman out there has ever said anything like that about him it was crazy but you know she was rotten from the start that being said if you're asking me the question is how do i feel about the verdict well you know i feel it's a goddamn victory lap and you know i got a ring <laughs> this is major like you know i'm so intrinsically connected and involved and like we cried and we laughed and you know he i was there for the first week of the trial i was also there obviously for the six years where the media wouldn't cover anything on his side there's been a lot of crazy big names out there people trying to keep this down everyone wanted to kill him and step up on his big dead body and it didn't work like a phoenix from the ashes he rose up and stood up for himself and you know he's changed the world with this and people think that that's corny to say but he has changed the world by being the only person that could shoulder this load and stand up so when that and for men for men, for and men. for men but people say oh this is bad for women no it's not it's bad for her she's bad for women so there it is so here's the thing right here's the thing to go through it all you know and there was a guy called adam walden and people probably heard his name during the trial he's a lawyer he built that case and he he developed those witnesses and he got those tapes out you know he was really the an unsung hero i always joked that like adam's number three in the call sheet of this whole thing and you know being close to adam and going through the uk trial which was completely corrupt you know i really also had an encyclopedic knowledge of the evidence and people that i never met and people that i didn't know but what they meant to the case and i was living and breathing it you know for six years but it was hard because he took a lot of l's and so as this happened i think an interesting thing some you know is that when johnny hit the stand first of all he was so glad you know he wanted it televised because right. nobody would put this story out. Nobody. They yeah. would jump on her story in a second, but nobody would put the real truths out there. So by having it televised every, or having it streamed, everybody could see it. Anyone who was interested could see it. Some people were like, oh, this is old news. Who cares? Well, very quickly, especially when he got on the stand, and then in week three when she got on the stand and gave the single oh, worst man. performance in the history of bad acting, and she sunk herself. So, you know, we started to feel it change. Now, people talk about the social media and the way the world supports him. What they did didn't know is for six years that was building itself and that's built not just by fans but the people try to debase it by saying oh it's fans no these are women these are men these are dv survivors these are people that were like there's no way this is true and there was so much facts and so much terminology and real evidence and testimonials that were put out there in the world over those six years that a lot of people knew what was going to transpire in this trial just hoping that it would stick properly with the jurors and it did because you know has, have you or anyone ever seen Johnny Depp talk like that? 
No. no. You've seen him on Letterman for two minutes. You've seen him tugging at his ears and like, you know, making jokes. But like, no one's seen him like that. He doesn't, he's not press hungry. He never does that stuff. No. So there he is talking like that. Even, even if it even felt weird to me. How about this motherfucker did a Christopher Walken impression of your dog dying? You know what I'm saying? Like, come on, bro. That's like, that's literally one of one in a million billion. Like he was doing Walken before everyone did it. But yeah. he did such a good fuck. I was like, I was like, wait, what the? Because that's Johnny doing. I was, I was like, holy shit. You know. So he goes up there on trial. Then th week three, she goes up, and I thought this dumbass i thought she was gonna deliver a better performance i was nervous like she could go up there and maybe she could sell people on it but yeah. she was so bad and then that idiot acting teacher of hers gets up there and says as a witness oh well when she's acting she can't cry well doing, doing, doing. obviously she just went up there for a week and couldn't cry so she was obviously acting but yeah it was just it was pathetic but bro your attorney at a case this big look i've been sued you know i've had litigation like bro you don't be like, yo, bitch, like, you need to get your shit on point. And Dude, the biggest, no. and you couldn't? Well, we had seen her also. She had given depositions in 2016 for their divorce. She had so many different accounts of her nonsense. And, you know, I had hoped she would go up there and do herself in. But, man, I couldn't imagine that she would do herself in as badly as she did. It was joyous. And the tide was changing. And now the world is growing. And they're even trying to blame it on social media. It's like, don't, no, no, no. Don't blame anything on social media. The jury don't, has no access to that. Yeah, don't, don't. Do, and you know what? The jury was definitely landslid you. And there's a reason why. Yeah. From the times I've met Johnny, the few times I've met him, right? Um, he always seems super chill, of course. You know, whatever. He's, you know, calm. And again, anyone could be, you know, have an off night after drinking or whatever. Even me, I don't drink like that. But, you know, whatever. It's like, I don't trust people off these incidents. Right? I don't trust numbers. I don't trust. Uh, I trust patterns, though. Okay. And prior to this, Johnny got into some legal drama, right? Before all this, right? And he won those two. Why was this so different? What do you mean? I mean, he got into lawsuits before, right? Well, here's, here's what happened. When... I think what happened is there was a whole little back channeling out here. A lot of these lawyers out here and these managers and these agents, a lot of people, even in the biggest stakes, they, they're all, this, these are, these are big money games here. This guy's a big money cottage industry himself. So I think there was a lot of people in cahoots. And I think at some point when all this was going down, he, he found out that same lawyer, Adam Waldman, killed the business manager he also testified that guy he got blasted he killed the business manager killed the lawyer this guy called jake bloom who had to end his firm and start a new one after this because these guys were up there robbing and they got in with the divorce lawyers everybody was robbing everyone had their hand in the cookie jar and i guess along with her they didn't think he'd fight back they thought he was a patsy and they were wrong damn they were very very wrong damn that's a bad bet that was a bad bet so um how many times have you, have you interacted with Amber? Like you met her before and everything? Well, of course. I mean, she was my, my dear friend of 35 years' his wife. I was at that rotten wedding. You know, I, interestingly enough, I never heard ever anyone have a good word to say about her. That's for real. And so that's crazy. before, and that's directors that we know, actors that we know. And before, when he got with her, or was kind of like whatever, hanging out with her, people were telling me like, dude, your boy's got to look out. That girl's rotten, da, da, da. And so... So wait, hold on. Did you know from the jump that she was bad, like a bad person? She was bad news? Anyone who ever brought her up to me, knowing that he was like, had made a movie with her and was now kind of messing with her, was like, dude, tell your boy to run. And I'm not going to out those friends of ours that tell me, I'm talking about big directors, real actors, people saying, tell, you know, Steve Bing, God rest his soul. He was very close with her, that wife of hers that she domestically assaulted back in 09 or whatever. He was close with her and Steve was telling me, Steve was like, dude, she's rotten. Guys, Steve Bing, billionaire, amazing dude, had a kid with Elizabeth Hurley. I brought him up on the show before. Legend. G. G. Fucking legend. Nicest guy. I got to meet him randomly through someone who also knows Josh, my brother-in-law, my sister's husband, Scott, who work with Guns N' Roses and everything else so random. But yeah, but fucking... Um, Jumped out of 27th floor window in COVID. <laughs> I mean, it's scary, sad, poor guy. I, I was with him a month before. I couldn't believe it. Are you serious? Steve, wow. Steve Bing, yeah. Anyway, so I had heard all this terrible stuff. And then here's what happened. This was the clincher. And this is the, this is the moment I meet this chick. Um, it's the premiere party for Rum Diaries. And it's going to be in a bungalow. The post party is going to be in a bungalow at the Chateau. And so I was with Frankie. 
my dear friend, business partner, um, friend of Ben's, neighbor of Ben's, kids go to school together. And Frankie, who's, you know, another gadfly in this town, knows everybody. He was saying, oh, you're going to meet my homegirl. I go, what? He goes, yeah, you know, I used to, I was like hanging out with her a little bit. I go, really? And he goes, yeah, but then one day she took me out to lunch and uh, told me she was a lesbian <laughs> and kind of iced it off. And we stayed friends or whatever, but, you know, just, just tell her, hey, for me. I'm like, okay. So I'm like, I already don't like this girl and I'm going to have, this is like a, a decent way to weigh in it. So I, I'm at the party. I'm, I, Hey, Johnny introduced me to her. And I said, oh, so, you know, I just want to tell you, uh, Frankie says hi. She looked at me kind of puzzled. And I said, you know, you know, my partner, Frankie Delgado, he just wanted to send his best. Glad to know you're doing good. And she looked me dead in my face. Like, I don't know who that is. Oh, and God, I was like, I oh, it. this lying ass. This, I couldn't, <sighs> like, gonna lie to my face. I'm like, so, and the funniest thing people always ask, you know, did he know? And I was like, he kind of did know because people did not pull strings around him. He, she yeah. says he's surrounded by a bunch of sycophants, but he's not. And people would say their displeasure with things. So that was hard. The wedding was even more brutal <laughs> because I knew, <laughs> I, I knew he didn't want to marry her, but like, he always knew. Jesus, it, he always knew that she was gonna be up to something like this. He always knew it, and there's stories about it. I actually gave legal statements about it. So it, it, ultimately, that's a lot of negativity, but the positivity is, is after six years of this burden and the world turning on him and the business turning on him, after six years, it's a huge victory. And he's, by the way, he's on tour with Jeff Beck. He's 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 living his best life in all honesty. No, I see and, it. I and he's chill. He's yeah. chill also. He wasn't, we were all bugging out surrounding him way more when this was going on. He's like been really even keeled about it. He's just been through so much, you know? No, I mean, he did an amazing job, right? And you just said the word turning three times, right? What were the turning points in the trial? Like, how did you see the tides change Right before your eyes. Well, I think we, I just said it. I, I really saw it. I was there the first week. It was very tense because nobody really knew. He would had taken nothing but a bunch of L's. So, you know, he, not, not a bunch of L's, but like the UK trial, which he wasn't suing her in the UK. He was suing a newspaper, RAG newspaper, um, and she was the witness. So a lot of the stuff that got into this trial didn't get into that trial. And the judge was definitely compromised and blah, blah, blah. I know I sound like a conspiracy guy, but <laughs> point is, it's all, it's all factual. He retired one nanosecond after and... uh I hope I see him one day. But this had been a rough ride. People, everyone was like, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? You know, And it's not to skirt your question about the tides, because I think I said that about when she testified and when he testified is when it really turned. You saw it, right? Yeah, but so the interesting thing is that, was that he's always been a big-time guy with Make-A-Wish, and he's got fans all... I mean, he's, he's like Michael Jordan, Muhammad Ali, Michael Jackson famous. He is. Like Bob Downey, who's a, the biggest beast of all, can walk to Cross Creek by himself and does. Johnny, because of his, his hats and his scarves and his knickknacks, like it's, you know, he, he no, just can't go sure, anywhere. No. No, and he, and he never really could. And, and without a Marvel movie, he could do this. You know what I'm saying? Oh, like yeah. It's just... Yeah. And so, you know, he's so beloved for 35 years in the public trust on all ends of the world that like... I think that his big thing was like, I just, I can't, I can't, every, cause big, you know, Guy O'Siri, Ron Burkle, Steve Bing, everybody was like, just let it blow over. Don't put yourself through this. Don't do this. And to give Guy O'Siri big love, he called right after it happened and said, hey, you didn't, I'm glad you didn't listen to my advice. You were right. I wow. was wrong. It was really, it was beautiful anyway. And, and I know Johnny was super touched by that. So we, it was a lot of big people telling him, dude, don't, don't, go, don't, don't, don't do, put yourself yeah, to this. Don't, okay. and, and, and you know, he just was like, I can't have every little kid that I met or my own children for that matter, which he said a lot in the trial. I, I just can't have people thinking this is true about me. I know I'm going to get put through hell, but like, I can't do it. I can't let that go down. I can't let someone get away with that, you know? And he didn't. And sit down. You lost. Good for him, dude. Let's talk about like, you know, what was like, I mean, you know, you're you out there. I remember you're like, like, oh, I'm here. Boom. Not that I know. Like it took me being out there just a few days ago. I was in Tyson's for four and a half days, four nights, and you didn't fucking know whatever. Boom. And I'm just thinking like, okay, you were chilling there. I was like, what not, are you doing? Yeah. I was just there, Ben. No just random, there. right? You know, like, dude, like you guys were cooped up. He's cooped up in fucking Tyson's, right? In, in our favorite hotel. And uh, it was funny because I was going to go eat at the Palm. Right, because it's the fanciest hotel, but you know, room, but I mean, fanciest restaurant. Sorry, but I like Randy's a little better, and but it's like more like not as private as the Palm is, right? Uh, I like the steak and Randy's better, but what was Johnny's mentals like? Well, like, what, what, how was he Dude, like? Dude, it's he crazy. There? I was just kind of touching on it, you know. While we're all tripping, he is super even keeled. He was, you know, he's remember he's been saying this stuff. 
No, but during the trial, he was ki- even yeah, killed he, then? No, I'm not going to lie. There was a, definitely that first week, and there, there was a lot of emotions. There's a lot of backfighting. Everyone thinks all, things all rosy-rosy with everybody and the lawyers, but it's not. Like, there's fighting. There's, you know, we had to have that one bitch thrown out of the court for handing off fake stuff you know like it was tense but i will say for what he had been through and what was weighing on his shoulders he was remarkably even keeled even when he was playing the royal albert hall with jeff beck just like may 30 may 31 he everyone's bugging they're about to come back the jury's deliberating and he's just he's kind of having the time of his life he feel i think he felt like listen i got it out there i needed everyone to see if they get it, cool. If they don't, cool. But I know it's out there now. It's The genie's out of the bag and you can't hide it. I call this wave of his, it's called like the global tsunami of people out there in the world. And I, his, so his temperature like that night when we did a celebratory dinner, Friday, May 27th, that was closing arguments when she got battle axed again. She just couldn't sit down. He went back up. So she's like, she had to go back up and she just got, she just got battle axed again. Where'd you guys, where'd you guys have dinner at? the palm <laughs> so so we go to the private room and had a real and uh johnny's manager jack wiggum he took us to a fantastic dinner and it was it was you know he facetimed with my son and christina like you know he was really chill and really enjoying himself That's he, dope, he was really unburdened and this is pre-verdict it was really unburdened and it was a beautiful feeling honestly and a great dinner. it's not weird bro does he eat steak what, what does johnny eat? does he eat a lobster what the well, fuck if you know him he's not known for <laughs> eating a lot lately he's been eating more he ate pasta that night drank the, the jack bought us tons of great wine and oh um, they got by the way they got a great linguine and clams at uh it's famous at the palm it's, is fucking, it? it's good i don't it's good. do linguine and clams but we did we he ate he ate we didn't he didn't eat steak that night i did i surfed and turfed and it was fantastic actually nice nice let's talk about some weirdos from jd's past right like i've known some of them right like the crazy thing is sal Janko, like bro you introduced me to him i dj at vipe room a few times right i kicked it there here Dude, this guy, you would leave me at your house. You would be gone. I don't, maybe six, seven hours, and I would be at the house with Sal, chilling with like my ex girlfriend's like kids, kicking it. And like, then I would go to Sal and hang out, and we would go kick it. And like, he would take me to go get pizza and shit. Like, what the fuck is it with? And that's an OG homie of, of Johnny's, right? I think a lot of people, you included myself, people want to be surrounded by the people that they trust the most right so when johnny got the tv show in canada he had his buddy that he grew up with in florida up out there and he became the janitor on the tv show they created a part for him because johnny was like i'm stuck up here i'm gonna have my boy up here and then after that you know the show was probably what 86 87 88 89 then viper room got happened in uh, august of 93 right after the hard rock vegas open which was an unbelievable weekend if you remember unbelievable and then uh um Sal was to run it, you know, it made sense. I mean, Johnny's not going to run in a club. He picks his friend he thought he could trust. And, you know, and Sal, by the way, did a great job for a really long time. I mean, he was the, he was the face of the club. And, and, and I think just over time, you know, wasn't he even in the band? He tried to have a band there for a minute called Colon Hole. I mean, you know, it was a lot of people that are in the hemisphere of really, really famous people. Sometimes it gets to him. And I think that Sal just, I, I don't know. I, I think he had a midlife crisis and whatever happened, essentially the club got lost. Like, But still, wasn't Sal very well taken care of? Like, why go and fuck? Like, I, 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 I'm not going to sit here and say what he did or didn't do. I'm right, just going right. to say that on his, okay. on his watch, the club got lost. Right. And, and, you know, Johnny's a loyal guy. And, and I think it was just, it was a lot to take. You know, I think he trusts people a lot. And look what happened. Business managers robbed him. Lawyers robbed him. Oh, shit. You know, everybody, you know. And if, if you don't stay on top of your stuff, that's going to happen. So ultimately, when you ask about Sal Jenko, who was a very mythical character in town for about 10 years, um, I, I, I hear he's okay. I think he has a kid that's probably getting up near late teens. And I think he's all right. Um, I don't know, you know, because he's, he's not in our world anymore. So I don't know. Yeah, I just think like, you know, you're big on loyalty. You're big. I mean, you you at least accept the new people. You know, you have to, you're, you're, you know, you might run a new club, new restaurant, new something, and you have cool people around. So, you know, you and Frankie have newer guys. But I can see like someone like him. He's like going to have, he's just only OGs around him. You know what I mean? Bob, same thing. Keanu, same thing. But like, you know, I'm just like, I don't know. I'm still 
dumbfounded by that whole Sal shit. Sometimes people just get drunk on the on the thing, you know. Like I think Sal got to the point where maybe he thought he was bigger than the than what made him, than what put him there. I don't know what happened to him because because it did get bad. I mean, the club was losing a lot of money. There was a lot of excess going on. I remember we'd be si- no, no. we'd be sitting in that office, which was like everyone rolled into that office, yeah, yeah, right? Of we'd be sitting in that little office. And he'd be like, "You want Tana's right now?" And he would like, call Dan Tana's up. Like, he was just living yeah. the life. But whatever it was, the profitability and or even just the the status quo of the club got lost. And there's a crazy story about the Viper Room that people don't talk about. When Johnny bought it, it was a place called the Central. Prior to that, it was Filthy McNasties in the '70s, and uh, and that whole block's about to get torn down. By the way, anyway there was a guy that was like a silent partner, some guy called Tony something, and they used to keep his picture by the cashier, so in case he came, he got taken care of. Never really came, and when he would come, he would come and like have a soda and leave, but he had to be left on the operating of the business. Nobody knows the story. Well, I mean, some people, but like it's not known, known. And something happened where he disappeared, and people tried to like implicate things like maybe Sal, I don't know, people, there was all these weird stories, but this guy at one point disappeared. And there was so much weird backstory to that club and this mythical place and poor River Phoenix dying there and just all the, you know, Johnny and I were just talking about this, by the way, literally just talking about this when I was out with him at the trial and then on tour in England, we were talking about, you know, Tom Petty opening night and then like, the Black Crows got up. Like every night, somebody with Lenny Kravitz, every night in those first few months, somebody got up. They're like, because that was the idea of it. While right. Johnny was there, people were just going to come and get up and play. Fuck, I forgot. I just remember now. And the Johnny Cash show, which well, was like. Dude, we, how about this? I went to you. I was like, I was like, what'd you just say? You said, um, it's the king of rock and roll. I was like, I, you mean Elvis? And you're like, no, motherfucker, come to this show. The first and the only time I've ever seen the dude, and I was ready to leave after like five minutes, and you're like, And you know who my plus one was? Was Danny Boy, and he was the same. He was ready to leave, too. You two hip-hop motherfuckers couldn't handle this hardness. But the funny thing was, outside that club one night, I forgot what it was. Was it Chris Farley? But you told somebody that that (laughs) Mark McGrath was Ethan Hawke. It, what, what, it was, was Chris it? Farley, that's right. Oh and that God. was right before Chris Farley died. And Chris was hammered. It wasn't that night. It was a different night. But I'm standing outside with Mark McGrath, who looked exactly like Ethan Hawke he when did. he was young. And I was, and Chris was like, Chris was around those days, wasted. He's like, hey, man, what's up? I go, Chris, have you met Ethan? Oh, hey, Ethan. And Chris Farley went and grabbed his girlfriend. He was like, babe, babe, got to meet Ethan. And then like he was dead like literally within six months. Jesus Christ. The big thing I want to end about any of this Johnny talk right now is one thing that I was telling my wife was, if any ex-girlfriend went up on a trial for me, uh, I'm getting cooked. Like, I'm getting fucking destroyed from any fucking ex. I don't give a fuck. Like, I, there, there's very, I mean, maybe one might say some good things. And like, I had an eighth grade girlfriend that got me out of trouble because she's a DA now in LA. She's an actual district attorney. But when Kate Moss went up and that was like, so dope. she sealed God. the fucking thing, bro, for her ex to go up there and co sign you like that. Well, she's also insanely press shy kate does kate's like a johnny type she doesn't seek press she I've doesn't never seen talk. Do press, yeah. and you know it's funny you want to know why that happened that happened because that dumbass went up there and threw her name out there she loves johnny and obviously you know but johnny never would have asked her to do that never she came out and said i'm doing this she put my name out there and my little 16 year old goddaughter's asking me did johnny Depp throw me down the stairs and she's like she was so pissed off and so Damn. That you know who has herself to blame for why Kate Moss came up there because she threw her name out there. Fuck, bro. So what do you think about this appeal? And like, you know, her, her attorney's like, she definitely cannot afford to pay this, blah, blah, whatever. Oh, but meanwhile, like. she had a $30,000 house she was renting the whole time with, yeah. all her, with all her fake friends in it. Right. Um, I don't know what to tell you, dude. I'm not going to get into all that craziness about who pays for her stuff. And I don't care about all that. And, and, and who, that, think- who that child of hers is fathered by. But at the end of the day, the words are out there and you all can check it out someone who makes rockets and cars um do you think though that they're going to drag this on again with the appeal or do you think it's just going to get th- i mean what do you think good luck ball don't lie <laughs> <laughs> good luck appeals are way harder all right man appeals so, are so way harder enough of that look man i'm so glad that you know you um you know i remember when frankie was telling me he's like dope dude i told josh man you gotta find a mexican girl you gotta have a kid and just be chill you got no trouble you know boom you know you had a kid late in life and um my boy russell peters had a kid like at 52 and, you know, random things like, how do you feel about that? Do you think like it was a bigger struggle now having the child, you know, raising a toddler at your age? Or do you think like, break that down for, I have some older listeners, right? Even though my listeners are younger, but 
A lot of guys are worried about it. Like, I got to be a dad. And blah. No, dude, you're not on a biological fucking clock like a woman is, you know? Like, Agreed. That's one thing. So like, ben, this how is, is that? Unbelievable question. Thank you for asking. It's really, it's the greatest achievement in the world. I mean, we're not put here to like, you know, collect art and like make jewelry and have nightclubs and go to football games. And like, you know, we're not, that's not what we're here for. We're here to make babies that's what human beings do so i had after my parents died i had always wanted that thinking well that's going to be the only source of unconditional love i'm ever going to have again you know when you're cut loose from your umbilical ties like i was at 21 and on acid and socks rocking around la so took a long time i got obviously very very lucky but it, your question is such an interesting question i would have given anything to have had kids when i was younger you know i, would, I even wish the same thing i wish i would have but i will say as an older person if you're thinking about it out there, uh, you know a lot more about life and you're a lot wiser and you've been through a lot more and you can impart some real wisdom to your child. And, you know, my son is, he is such a, he's just, <laughs> if you asked me to draw up my kid, I couldn't draw him better than he is himself. And I, I'm so honored by him. You know, Bob Downey used to always say, your kids choose you. So if True chose Christina and I, then then I'm grateful that that happened like that. And, and, and what you say is true, you know, any time in life, as long as you're gonna do it, uh, you just have to devote the time to it. You know, I, my New Year's resolution this year was, even though I'm fat and old and tired, I like give more time to True when he wants to like, when you're tired and he wants to go play at 5.30 in the afternoon, you go play in that yard with him and you go run around with him on his scooter. Or you, you do that, that, because there's gonna come a time when he's not gonna wanna do that with you. A million and, percent. And so like, I ended up, and this, this is like one of the crowning achievements of my life. I coached his baseball team, his first little baseball team. I say baseball because it's T-ball, but our team pitches the ball in this league. So I'm real proud of that. And I wasn't planning on coaching it. I got thrown to the wolves. I saw that my kid wasn't going to get the instruction that was going to help him really learn this game and like learn how to you know evolve physically. And so I threw my whole life into it. In fact, I came home from that crazy whirlwind thing with Johnny. I flew home and made sure I was here for True's last baseball game, which was Saturday. And I cried when I left the field. It was really one of the great achievements of my life. And my son, I know how much that being a, a hands-on parent, like you are so much with your children, it's uh, there's nothing better to focus on. Nothing. People, and people think, oh, my money's not right, or my this, my that, or I'm not ready to have kids yet. Nobody's ready. No one is ever ready. No yeah. woman is ready. No one is ever ready. But I almost had a kid at 23, right? That would have been hard. And I'm gonna be honest with you. I wasn't ready then. When I was ready, it was ready, and timing was a motherfucker. So it's just an amazing thing. And like you said, look, dude, I had to fly back to make sure I made Ryder's birthday. I had to fucking miss out on a $100,000 check in Minnesota because one of my biggest sponsors, Captain Morgan, was doing this huge party. I'm like, look, man, I, you, could, you could say what you want to. I can't miss my son's birthday. It's just not going to happen. I'm not going to risk what if something in the Midwest, the three-hour time window? No, no, I can't. There's no way. I can't do that. And, um, I wish more parents thought about it like us, but maybe because we did have kids and we were a little bit older, we understood the value. And it doesn't mean that you can't do it well in your twenties, but it's in, and it's also it's their mother. Like you got it, you got to have oh, man. a child, got to have a great mom. I got mom, so fucking you know? lucky, bro. So true is really lucky in that case as well. Yeah, man. Uh, something real light. Who do you got winning the NBA Finals, man? Wow. I haven't been as plugged in because I was traveling, obviously. You go to Europe, by the way, you're getting no sports. As yeah. you know, you're getting some <laughs> bullshit like soccer. <laughs> like you can't, Trust me, bro. You, you're getting nothing. So, um, I mean, you can't even like bootleg ESPN over there. You can't, and don't bro, forget bro, NFL Network. Trust me, only Asia could you. But, because. So here we go. Um, uh, Jason Tatum, there's a guy that I met through Frankie who's a just unbelievable guy called Drew Hanlon. He's Jason's like, coach essentially and so i've met jason and he's come around hide and stuff and you know he's super nice with my son and i just he's such an unbelievable physical specimen he's like a bigger kobe he's so beastly and it's so nice to see them there and obviously as laker lovers we're celtic haters but the nba it doesn't even tap into the old school rivalry so i just said on my episode two weeks ago before the, the final test said this is the most likable boston celtics team yes. Ever. Marcus Smart comes in the spot all the time. Great guy. I like their team. I like the way they built it. Red Auerbach's dead anyways. Who cares? One of my friends is on the team sitting on the bench. My boy Nick Stauskas, okay? Who's a fucking three-point beast. Top three pick out of fucking University of Michigan. But I'm just saying... Who do you think is going to win? Well, so I would like them to win because I really would like Jason Tatum to get that ring. And, Me too. And I would love that for Drew as well. But, you know, the great thing is, is I'm not mad at Golden State. I'm not mad at them. 
You know, they're, I like their team. Neither am I. I'm not mad at them. And I like the new kid, Jordan Poole. So at the end of the day, you're asking, I don't really have a dog in the fight. And I, I can't tell you that I know who's going to win. I think it's very hard to beat Golden State. You know, if Golden State is in a game late, they are hard to beat. But Golden State was kicking that ass in the fucking second half on game one and fucking boss came back and whooped yeah. that ass. So I think they, they, they got the experience. They've been there. I'm not going to predict, but you know, you're asking me to like talk basketball. I think that they're very hard to beat with that veteran leadership. And plus, you know, if Golden State is within striking distance, you know, <laughs> it's hard to stop them. But they've also got Marcus Smart, right? So, yeah. you know, I... I Dude, uh, each player, each starting five... Made fucking first team all defense NBA. Like it's pretty dope. Crazy. This is a great, I'm happy about it. Normally I'm a little down on the NBA in general. These kids are just rich stone kids oh, who like man, fax it in crazy. half the time. When I think about the days when we used to watch and dudes are getting blasted to the floor. Like I don't like flagrant fouls and ticky tacks and flagrant Your twos. should have got ejected last and, night. This yeah, fucking bullshit, and bro. flopping and all that. This this modern, I hate that. This I hate modern that. NBA is a three point shooting contest with stoned, you know, hundred millionaires. Fine. But in this series is nice though. So hopefully I would like to see Tatum get his ring because these guys have already had theirs. That's over how there. I feel about it. Yeah. But and I'm I not got... ma- but I'm not mad at Golden State. Normally I'm mad at somebody. So today I'm not. I love it. Um what do you think about our Dodgers this year? We got a chance to get the WS or what? Yeah. I mean, well, you know, baseball, it's a long ride and you gotta have pitching. And so no, for sure. pitching's gotta stay healthy. We're gonna have to get lucky there. Um if Kirk, I need Dustin May to come back. Yes, we need Dustin May to come back. And also if we if Kershaw can just eat innings, because he's not the same Kershaw, but boy, he's such a he's such a crafty veteran. If he can just eat a lot of innings, also you know, we've we've been relying on Kenley Jansen for a lot of years. We we've got to make sure Christ, that that bro. works. But our, I hope that guy never ever fucking I don't ever want to see that much. When I hear <laughs> California love and he's coming out, bro, right then and there, I get fucking PTSD from 2017 <laughs> World Series of us. Fu- I know there's trash cans being banged and stuff, but still. Um, have you ever seen a better and remember, dude, I, my first fucking baseball game was 78 fucking New York Yankees fucking World Series I was in LA. I have ran you, on the field after that. Have you ever seen a better one-two punch than Freddie and Mookie? Oh my God. It's it's unbelievable. I couldn't believe when we got Freddie. Like he's a Dodger killer. He's such a great player. But it's not. Look at the whole lineup. I know our lineup is nasty. It's it's just crazy, right? Yeah, our lineup is nasty. And it was great meeting Mookie in the box at the Rams Cardinal playoff game. He's a really nice guy. So the last question every single guest that comes on this show is asked. um, There's no avoiding it. Every single person. Uh oh. George Lopez, you name it. Uh oh. Is is there anything you'd like to ask me? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, bro. Early on, why did you know Bitcoin was such a smart thing? You know what, man? I can't say I knew. What's your timing on it? I'm in there, Guy Siri, before $100. Wow. I'm in there for $100. Little Korean kid had just lost his family, and he inherited like $180,000, which wasn't a ton of money, but... He put a hundred of that hundred thousand, you know, at around thirty four, forty bucks. Four, sorry, forty three dollars. And he was buying Bitcoin, you know, at that number. Put a hundred grand into it. Years later, this little kid who was nineteen is now, you know, legal age, still a goofy as hell. Probably still. No, I can't say that he might have paid for some pussy, but <laughs> he's a Korean kid. Bought a R eight, bought a crib and everything else. And I was like, yo, okay. I'm still in under a thousand. Fuck this. Let me jump in this shit. You know what I mean? And it was it was just a fucking. It was a great thing. And you know, how still, glad are you that you did? Oh it? come on, bro. You look. I showed you. You know, what I, even though even though I'm down eight figures, you know, I'm but about to be up. You're not down. Yeah, I haven't sold shit. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And by the way, thank you for connecting me with fucking Alex Holmes. I'm so glad that I fucking read. Alex, big love to Alex Holmes. Yeah. Open note. Yeah. I didn't even know he fucking played. I can't believe he was the fucking USC show. Dude, Alex in, Holmes, like, he recruited that entire dynasty, bro. And it's funny. I was saying that this this thing with Johnny was the second greatest moment of my life other than my child being born. Um, because it really was. It was such an exaltational thing. But I will say, close rival was those years I spent inside that USC dynasty with Matt and Reggie and Alex. And really one of the great things in my life because my dad was such an SC person. So I felt like I was carrying the torch. And those were those were some of the greatest times. The Raider ring, the Raider rings, you know, and those Laker times and with the pick fair and Rick and all that and the, and the SC stuff. But man, I think that number one outside of my child is what just happened in Fairfax, Virginia with Johnny. One insane moment of my life was, is it George Raveling? 
college coach, basketball coach. Yeah. Was that his name? 19... Washington, Washington State. No, no, no. Troj Trojan's coach. After Washington State. Yeah. yeah. Trojan's coach. 1992, we only play five D1 basketball teams, you know, in the season, right? Usually two, three in the, in the preseason. And what they do is D1 teams want to beat up on a D2 team, so they'll pay us money. We get money for our program. So this was a season game. We played against USC at, um, what the fuck's the arena called? Why the fuck am I drawing a blank? The um, Keysar, not Keysar. What the fuck is a, Where? what's the what's the basketball? USC's basketball court. Oh, sports arena. Oh, Galen. Galen. Galen Center. We're getting blown out by like 28 and I get my game on. A lot of guys from high school get to see me and shit. This is before I met you and stuff. Obviously ballistics is going on, but like. Oh, so that's not Galen. That's sports arena. Was it sports arena? Yeah, sports Galen's arena. later. And it was crazy because 92, you know what I'm saying? And um, it was just kind of a cool thing. I got to play for like two and a half minutes and it was, it was dope. Was it Harold Minor? Harold Miner was not there at that it time. It was right after Harold Miner. Yeah, it was right after Jeff Harold Miner. Jeff Trapagne. Jeff Trapagne was there. Um, fuck, tall, lanky. Dark, I forgot what the fuck his Scalabrini. name was. Scalabrini? No. <laughs> not Scalabrini. But it was funny because, uh, you know, I played against Harold Miner in high school. I did not know so, that. So, yeah, then. we used to, because his name is Hare Old Miner. So we used to call him Afro Young Major. Right. And the funny thing was, I have he, Ben's game jersey, by the way, that I've had since the 90s. Thank you. By the way, he's really baby Jordan. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. was fucking Inglewood High School. He scored 52 against us, you know. But, bro, listen, um, that was fucking amazing. Uh, it flowed amazing. And I really appreciate it. I'm so gracious that you came on. I the appreciate show. it even more than you know, Ben. Thank you. And, and let me tell you something. We could probably go another couple rounds. Dude, that was nothing. <laughs> uh, listen, we'll do a part two. And I want to kind of, kind of like, I really want to dig deep into that 90s, you know, just the, the nostalgia, man. Fuck. Well, bro. I'm proud Just, of you, dude. You've really, whoever doesn't know this, this dude has made this himself. He did not have leg ups. Now, whether his family was a good family or not, like the point is, is he made his way in all this madness. By the way, being the fast talking Korean kid, which there wasn't a whole lot of, and he he <laughs> really has come, I'm still pretty awe inspired. I mean, when this guy's making his own Topps Chrome baseball cards, like I'm just, I'm giving a hats off. Like, you know, I gave you my mom's autobiography you got to read you know, what she went through in life and everything you know we didn't come here with no money so it's like that was true and like black you know, fish blackfish, blackfish. <laughs> I, i'll tell you guys blackfish later in a, on a whole different thing but yo josh i really appreciate it i love you bro i love you back ben thank you this was just fantastic man. yeah man yo miles man throw on some lakey lake real quick let's pay some bills and we'll be right back ball don't lie Hey guys, we've seen so many people make ridiculous money from crypto, but did you know it's easy for you to do the same? The Copy My Crypto membership site shows you the coins that the YouTuber James McMahon personally holds and allows you to copy him. It's like having a big brother who knows what he's doing. You don't need to know a thing about crypto or how to invest as simply do what he does. So let me tell you more about James. He runs the Crypto with James YouTube channel, which has over 17,000 subscribers. And since March 2020, he's told his viewers to buy 26 crypto coins. Had you put in a hundred bucks in each one of those, it would now be worth over $53,000. Of the 26 coins, his top pick of the year is a coin called Phantom. It's currently up over 410 times from when he said. That one call alone has retired a number of people, including guys and girls in their 20s and 30s. Remember, this is public knowledge. You can go to YouTube and verify this for yourself. So if you'd like to join the 1300 members who copy James, then stop what you're doing now and head over to copymycrypto.com slash Ben. You'll not only find proof of everything I just said, but my listeners will get full access for just $1. You won't find this offer anywhere else, but act fast because this offer ends soon. That's copymycrypto.com forward slash Ben. That's B-E-N. Don't take this offer lightly. He's the real deal. Go visit the site now. It's time. Parents. Time to finally cross off one of the most important things on your to-do list, and that's life insurance. Fabric makes getting a great term life insurance policy for your family quick, easy, and surprisingly affordable. 
Fabric was built by parents for parents to help make it easier to manage your family's finances. Fabric is all online, so everything is on your schedule. You don't need to schedule anything or make time for phone calls or appointments. Just apply online when it's convenient for you. It takes less than 10 minutes to apply, see your quote, and then personalize your quote to fit your family's needs. You could be offered coverage instantly with no health exam required. Fabric's new lower prices mean significant savings over other providers with great quality policies like a million dollars in coverage for less than a dollar a day. Fabric also has over 1,600 five-star reviews on Trustpilot.com and it's fully backed by Vantis Life, one of the most trusted names in life insurance since 1847. So you can feel confident that you're getting a high quality policy that is perfect for your family. Fabric has a 30 day money back guarantee and you can cancel at any time. Fabric's online hub lets you handle all your family finances in one place, not just life insurance, create a will, start your kids college saving plans and even set up a rainy day savings fund. That's meetfabric.com slash baller. M-E-E-T fabric.com slash baller. Protect your family's financial future with fabric. Apply today in just 10 minutes at meetfabric.com slash baller. Fabric insurance agency policies issued by Vantis Life, not available in New York and Montana. Prices subject to underwriting and health questions. Hope you guys like that, man. Um, it's funny. Miles has obviously heard 283 fucking episodes, and he's like, "That's probably one of my favorite interviews." Um, and it was weird, you know. It was organic. It was just, you know, it was different having my boy in the man cave. It was dope. He told me last night that it was fucking Johnny Depp's birthday today, which is fucking crazy. The thing about Josh is, is there's a lot of similarities between me and him. He's obviously been around longer. He's um. I don't think I ever looked at him as a mentor, but I definitely looked at him as a big bro in in a serious way. I just recalled something recently. Um, I'm sorry. I just recalled literally during this interview, like we listened to the interview and I never listened to the interviews. I borrowed $5,000 from Josh and I remember paying him back really quickly, but it was just really funny because I've never borrowed money from anybody before. And there's just a lot of similarities, just a lot of similar shit that just, just the way he is, um, he could be very brash. Um, he's not the most humble person, but he's actually very humble when it comes to his friends. He has real relationships with these people and uh, it was just fucking crazy. It, this was, <laughs> again, we have to get him back on. And uh, yeah, that's what it is. Um, guys, I got to remind you guys, in uh, just a couple hours, 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, if you're listening to this show in real time, my gold surfboard drops. It is expensive. It is not cheap. It's a very fucking high quality surfboard. If you guys saw what my dominoes were like, then you know the surfboard shit is no joke. So don't forget, I'll be live on the network app, you know, uh, for this drop. We only made 25 of these surfboards. Very rare. Now I got to bring up something real quick. My tailor-made collab is going to be pushed back a little bit. I'm not really happy about that, but it's got to be done the right way. There was a middleman that was involved. And I didn't really know this. I thought I was just dealing with directly with TaylorMade because I am legitimately fully endorsed by TaylorMade. This ain't no joke. This ain't some part-time sponsorship. I'm really sponsored by them. Yes, I am a horrible golfer and I am new, but I will say this with all the faith in the world. Motherfuckers, I'm about to be in that ass like a wedgie for real, okay? I'm about to be for real, for real in that ass like a thong. I'm really going to be deep in that motherfucking ass in this golf shit. I have played golf four times this week. I'm going to aim for six. I got one of the best coaches, and I legitimately have one of the best trainers who is in Trotty, who is the only man I've already told you guys, that Tiger, and a few other the best players on earth, trust with their swing, with their game, everything all above. I'm getting serious with this shit now. Back to TaylorMade. There's no more middleman. You know, even though I'm dealing with the marketing team direct and things like that, it was uh, some sort of small discrepancy. Fuck it. It's all good. Now we're going to do a full-blown capsule 
We're going to have some sick-ass fucking high premium golf gloves with the BB logo on there, got divot tools, head covers, drop some balls, uh, TPX5s. You know that's my ball. Um, I got a lot of spin on my motherfucking, uh, on my hits. But I'm fully engulfed in this golf world, the golf game. I'm beyond, beyond. So, you know, we're going to do a driver. We're going to do a fucking wedge. We're going to do some shit. We're going to do some irons. We're going to do some, some really sick shit. Like the, as custom and as good as it gets. Um, there is another collaboration coming out. And there was some hater shit that I thought was coming from that camp. And you're going to know about it because not many people collab with TaylorMade, right? I was one of the first ones in that culture part that did, you know, last year with my putter. But I can't tell you who it is, but someone's dropping, you know, a big collab with them. And I'm coming with some heat, okay? So don't sleep. Don't forget, my gold surfboard drops at motherfucking 3 p.m. Pacific time. That is in a couple hours. You know, London's had, had a really good practice with Ron Del Barrio, my coach. He had a good first practice with them. Definitely, I think maybe five, six practices in, London's going to be a whole, totally different golf player. And um, I'm glad he's starting young. I bought him some clubs. I think I, I told you guys that. You know, he got some some tailor-mades. And um, went to go practice putting yesterday. And putting is my strongest skill in golf, right? Your short game is, is the most important. Chipping is just not my shit, right? And I need to practice on that. And my swing is getting there. I'd say it's like 60%, right? But as far as where my aim is and that type of stuff, yo, know, I'm doing all right. It's consistent. I don't give a fuck if somebody's watching. I don't care about none of that shit. Now, as far as the look of it, you know, it, it's going to change a couple more times because it needs to get to where it needs to get to. You know, everyone wants to straight elbow or whatever, but I'm talking about scoring wise, you know, I'm getting to the motherfucking ball, yo. You know what I'm saying? And Monday, I hit a 32 at Weddington and, and that's, you know, a par three course, nine holes. Yo, that's five over. You know what I'm saying? Like, come on, man. Y'all need to stop playing around. And, you know, I don't cap. Motherfuckers think that shit's like a joke. I be telling people straight up like, yo, I ain't got no reason to lie because motherfuckers are going to see me play. You know, it ain't like I'm hiding somewhere, you know. And um, London loves golf. Practice some putting. He's trying to get used to it. And I only have one putter for him. And Ryder wanted to come along. So Ryder started crying. I want to play golf too. I want to play golf too. But he's so, you know, deep in jujitsu and he's really good at it. So I said, fuck it. Went over to Roger Dunn. I bought Ryder a putter. And uh, it was a little big, you know, a little bit. And so they had them, I had them custom cut it down. So he has a custom little putter now, that, you know, so him and Ryder can, uh, him and London can both go with putt. And so, you know, practice about 30 minutes or so at Roger Dunn. We played 30 minutes, tried to do about 45 minutes at a local putting range. And, um, you know, we're in this shit for real, for real now. And uh, London's, you know, still on his team. He's in, he's in summer camp with it. And I'm just super fucking excited. Like super, super, super fucking geek that London loves it. And Ryder likes it. You know what? It's not really a big deal. Fuck it. You know, I got it. Let's, uh, you know, they can share the clubs when they're at the range. If Ryder can start learning how to hit balls, it's fine. They can share them. And the funny thing is, Nicolette, is, my son is, London is nine. And he's four foot nine. Okay, so he's only an inch shorter than my mother-in-law. He's only like, you know, five inches shorter than Nicolette. Nicolette could use these clubs. But in a year or so, London could get some custom-fitted clubs. And uh, my wife can use them too. And then Ryder could grow into them and play these, whatever. And it's all good. And then later, Kai could use them. So I'm excited about buying that shit. And I'm excited about investing into that. Now, everything in the golf world is in a frenzy right now because of this Live Golf Saudi league now saudis don't have enough time to talk about that whole uh way of life and how they kill people who are gay and, and just how strict they are on certain things you know um i've been to saudi arabia i have been to the uae i have been you know all over there and it's all good look they got a shitload of money people are criticizing phil mickelson and dustin johnson for going over leaving the pga to play the, the live you know golf league um but they're still able to play like for the majors, which is kind of weird. You know, I understand both sides. Competition wise, you're going to go to live and play against who, right? You know, playing against some dudes who ain't really that good. So it's kind of like, okay. And they did pull a lot of people. They didn't pull everyone though. You know, PGA is always going to be the top dog. So it's like, you know, there was the XFL trying to go against, uh, at the time was it Paul Tagliabue and um, the NFL and it just didn't, didn't rock. And there was another one. I forgot what it was. What the fuck was it? 
was it XFL when he, the dude he had she hate me or he hate me or some shit? I forgot these crazy ass names in the back. It wasn't arena football, but they got a bag. Dustin Johnson got $125 million to join the league. Let me tell you something like, yo, get the bag. And let me tell you something. If I was if I was him, if I was DJ, I'm leaving Paulina Gretzky. You please believe that shit. Bitch is out of here. Taking that 125 M's and, and getting the fuck out. Like, you know, but um, I get it. PGA has been, uh, you know, a conglomerate, right? They've been a monopoly. They, they've cornered the market. They're the big bully on the block. No one's ever challenged them, whatever. And now this is kind of getting there and there's Saudi money. Why are people getting so excited? Getting so mad? Like, if this was any other business, you know, motherfucker leaves, you know, uh, shit, Konami to go play for Riot Games or fucking Activision, some shit like that. Leaves Google and goes to Apple. That shit happens all the fucking time in other businesses. But because, you know, there's one NFL, there's one sport. It's just like, you know, like, fuck it. You know, it's, let's see what happens. Will it be long-lived? I don't know. I don't think so. But take that bread. They offered fucking uh, Tiger like a billion dollars or some shit. Tiger's like, nah, fuck that. I'm staying in the PGA. You know, but more power to him. Am I going to watch it? I'll see what the fuck it is. That'll determine, you know, what, I mean, but who knows, you know, people, money talks, man. People want to make money right now. You know, again, I told you guys, man, we're in a mini recession right now and it's going to get worse. You know, um, I've talked about it. The housing market is starting to feel it. And I don't think you guys have seen it yet. It's just the regular consumers who don't know much about the real estate market. But yo, mortgages are down. That's no cap. And you're going to see that the market make a little correction. But um, yeah, man, you know, I'm just all about that golf shit. I'm all about that motherfucking golf action, period. Uh, I didn't get to do an intro on this show. So one thing that was the biggest thing of this week to me was Apple iOS 16 for iMessages on the iPhone. You can now edit and unsend messages, and that shit is crazy. Now, some people are like, oh, man, Android had it before with WhatsApp, blah, blah. Motherfucker, we had WhatsApp on... I never heard of WhatsApp on a motherfucking Android, even though I know it existed, but I'm saying, like, people on WhatsApp, they were using it because encryption, right? iMessages are encrypted. You don't got to use Signal if you don't want to, but, like, you know... WhatsApp is on iPhones and all that. You can't edit a message on iPhone. You could unsend a message. Now, the thing is, when like you do certain things on Instagram, when you unsend a message, if the person gets notifications, they'll say this most message is no, no longer um, available, and you won't know who sent the message, right? On WhatsApp, you'll see the message was deleted. I'm like, oh, what the fuck did they send? I always thought that was kind of weird, whatever. I don't know. It's just weirdo shit. But, um, you know, this is editing, you could say shit like, you know, oh man, you owe me seventeen thousand dollars. And the person like, okay, yeah, I know. I'm like, no, motherfucker, you owe me seventeen million dollars. I don't know. We'll see what the fuck it is. I think it's a huge situation. It's gonna be a hot boy summer. It's gonna be some shit. It's gonna be a hot girl summer too, because they ain't gonna be capping on that motherfucker. It's gonna be some shit. Okay. Um, speaking of shit, I really didn't want to get too deep into fucking uh, Deshaun Watson's situation. You know, I, I wanted him to play for the Seahawks. You know, thank God I wasn't thinking straight and I was just thinking like, yo, man, we need to fucking figure this out because this Drew Locke versus Geno Smith situation just ain't really great for us. But we got no choice now at this point. We just need to figure out the run game. And thank God we got two great receivers that can carry, you know, two lesser QBs, right? But mini camp came and uh, DK Metcalf didn't pull up. I talked to DK a few times this week. We didn't talk about that, but he seems all right. Seems like he knows what he's doing. So I'm not worried about the situation too much. And he's fucking with Seattle heavy. I just think he needs to get his paper and whatever. And he's he's here in LA. And he's going to be on the show, you know, we just got to figure that out. But now back to Deshaun Watson. When I first heard the situation, there was like a dozen girls, right? Then there was what, 15 or something. And then it went to a criminal trial. And I said, let's see what happens. And, and people say, oh, you can't blah, blah, whatever. No, no, that meant a lot to me. People say, oh, fuck that. You know, OJ lost civil trial. I don't give a fuck about none of that shit. You know, and a lot of people will tell you, you know, I mean, him not guilty in that criminal shit, that was just unfucking believable work by the Cochran group. Not to plug my attorney, but just saying by Johnny Cochran, you know. And, you know, that means something. You know, people say, oh, well, 15 girls aren't lying, 20. I, look, I was with him for a little bit. I've had fucking 15 people accuse me of shit before. And I won it, and I was still victorious, right? Some people don't realize that you can have three people who are salty. 
And then the story stays the same because they all coincide with each other, right? And they start to get their stories in order and everything becomes a lot more similar because they're talking about the same thing, right? Now, Deshaun had consensual sex with some of these women, allegedly, whatever. And then, um, you know, it was, it was 23, it was this, it was all these crazy numbers, okay? This week, the New York Times released that there was 66 girls that he hired as masseuses and massages. Now, the thing is, look, I know when you're young, I ain't talking about now, I'm just being real. real. When you're young, you can bust a nut, you know, a couple times a day. It ain't shit, right? <laughs> it ain't nothing, right? 66 massages. Look, if you get a massage every five days, let's say you're bar, I mean, I can afford a massage every day if I want to write them. I got money, but... 66 massage, look, look, a massage a week is some shit. I ain't gonna lie to you. When I, at one point when I was really stressed in my life, I was getting a massage almost every week and it was taken care of through my insurance and that felt fucking amazing, okay? Now, you know, there's happy ending massages that you might get from your significant other, whatever. I don't know about a stranger situation, right? Just a total stranger. Um, that's a little bit exotic and risque to me. But 66, y'all, that motherfucker was on the Texans for barely two fucking years, two seasons, okay? 66. Like, that's a motherfucking hand job, uh, all kinds of shit. There was crazy ass, uh, some of the stories were like, yo, man, he busted a nut in chick's mouth, like, and by accident, because the motherfucker was shooting loads, like, he was Shawn Michaels, or like, he was motherfucking, what's the dude's name? Lexington Steel, no, not Lexington Steel. What the fuck is it? Lexington Steel is that his dude's name? I forgot what the fucking guy's name was. Um, no, that's yeah, Lexington Steel. That's what it was. <laughs> There's an old dude named Jake Steed way back in the aftermath days who was on uh, the 2001 album. But yeah, 66 motherfucking girls, guilty or not. Let me tell you something. It is bad for the NFL brand. Okay, my man Calvin Ridley got suspended for putting $1,500 on himself on a game at on a motherfucking legal betting site. Like, this shit's crazy. So at first I was kind of like, ah, oh, man, you know, man, you can't suspend this dude that quick. You know, he won the criminal charge. But now they're making this shit. Like, it ain't cancel culture. It's something totally different. This is about doing your civil duty, doing what's right. And he's bad for the brand, period. So, yeah, man, he got a motherfucking go. He got a motherfucking go. Now, Last, before we jump out of here, because this is a fucking amazing episode, because I got to, you know, reunite with my boy Josh, um, NBA Finals. And uh, if you guys heard that Captain Picks ad, yeah, we got this NBA Finals shit, Game 5. I am not going to San Francisco. I'm going to be here in LA at Dave & Buster's. We're going to turn up. But Game 3 was in Boston. I see my man, Matt Kalish, friend of the podcast. He was on the show. He was the founder, co-founder of DraftKings. Sitting courtside, obviously he's a fucking huge fucking Celtics fan. And I see it both ways. People don't like him. My boy Mike Rapport wants the Warriors to win. I don't hate the Warriors. I like them cool, but this is different. Like, I'm a Laker fan, right? And I'm fucking, you know, I like the Boston story. And usually when Boston wins a chip, guess what happens the next year? The Lakers usually win a chip. So whatever. Look, man, it's 2-1 right now. Boston's up. There were some people who were doubting. They thought that Boston was going to choke. Look, I think Boston goes up 3-1, okay? Then they take it back to the Bay. So the Bay's got to win it with game six there, right? You know what I'm saying? If not, you know, they got to go to a game seven. And, and, you know, I just think that the series is exciting. Anyone who said the game or this matchup in this series wasn't exciting is fucking stupid. This is everything you fucking wanted in the NBA Finals. This is definitely more than I wanted from last year's Finals times 100. This is more than I wanted from that Miami Lakers pandemic Finals. And people were saying, oh, the pandemic. No, no, fuck that. Pandemic shit was hard. That was a motherfucking hard place to win. Okay. But I only got one thing to say about this game three. Robert Williams III is injured, and that motherfucker was balling. Hustle out of control, defense out of control, game-changing plays out of control. Al Hoffer, the whole fucking team playing defense. Marcus Smart on his shit. Boston played their fucking asses off. And it wasn't like fucking, uh, you know, Clay and fucking Steph weren't balling. 
The motherfuckers had 25 and 30 or some shit, right? Like, the motherfuckers was playing some ball. Now, Draymond, yeah, two, three, four. Two points, three rebounds, four, whatever. Look, at that motherfucker didn't play. Look, I'm not being a hater. I'm just being, like, I can't believe he's even in the top 10 most assists in the fucking finals. This fucking, but, I mean, I get it because he's got Steph there or whatever. But, like, Draymond is a fucking hack, okay? I don't, dude, is it something, man? Like, yo, Draymond is the fucking 2022 Bill Lambeer. Nobody I know likes that dude. Warriors fans that I know don't like him. They'd be like, oh, yeah, it's great to have him on the side. But no, no one like, no one's trying to, oh, you know what? Let's hang out with Draymond. No, he ain't getting the call to kick it. People really got it popping, you know what I'm saying? Like, they, like no, no, no. Game four, we'll see. Game five, they back in SF. We'll be at Dave & Buster's. Make sure you pull up. Um, I appreciate everybody who listened to this new episode today because a lot of new listeners are listening to this episode. How do I know? Because I fucking know. Because Johnny Depp has got a crazy fucking army. And, um, you know, this was a, a special thing getting with my boy Josh. And we got to speak and give you some insight about what was going on behind the scenes of the trial. One of the most famous trials of this year, for sure. But make sure if you do like what you heard today and you like me, you like my voice, whatever the fuck it may be, tell a friend to tell a friend. Subscribe to the podcast. Helps us out a lot. And uh, I will see you guys same bat time, same bat channel. Anywhere you listen to podcasts, Behind the Baller, Mondays and Thursdays, 12 p.m. Pacific time. See you guys on Monday for the weekend wrap up. We got more interviews coming. We got more shit coming. I will see you at Dave and Buster's. We're going to get it in. And I'd like to thank Josh for coming on the show again. I'd like to thank Legal Cartel for the theme song. My man, Lakey Lake, for the original music. And my boys, Jordan and Miles, the Dust Brothers, for the motherfucking crystal clear diamond clarity production. All right, y'all. Let's get the fuck out of here. My man Lakey Lake has got something to say. Peace. <laughs>